Hi everyone, welcome to Bite Size Med, where we talk about quick bite sized concepts in medicine for study and rapid review. This video is on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The kidney has millions of nephrons, and each nephron has a glomerulus and a renal tubule. The first part of the renal tubule is the proximal convoluted tubule, which then leads into the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and finally the collecting duct. This portion of the nephron has the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Let's magnify it a little. So the JGA has three kinds of cells. Modified cells of the distal convoluted tubule called the macula densa, the extraglomerular mesangial cells, and modified smooth muscle in the wall of the afferent arteriole called the juxtaglomerular cells. These JG cells store pro-renin, which is an inactive form of renin. So when stimulated, pro-renin molecules form renin, the active protein enzyme form. If it's an enzyme, it's got a substrate. And that renin substrate is a globulin called angiotensinogen. So renin catalyzes the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, a peptide. It's a mild vasoconstrictor, but is not significant enough. Within a few seconds to minutes, it gets converted to a smaller peptide, angiotensin 2, by the angiotensin converting enzyme, predominantly in the lungs. Angiotensin 2 is the one that is strong enough to have effects before it gets inactivated by angiotensinases. Now let's see what angiotensin 2 does. It has direct effects and indirect effects on the vessels, the kidney, the adrenal cortex, the posterior pituitary, and the hypothalamus. First, let's look at the direct effects. Angiotensin II has a type 1 receptor in blood vessels. It's called angiotensin, so simple to remember is that it constricts vessels, arterioles more, so it increases total peripheral resistance, and so the blood pressure. It has two direct effects on the kidney. First, at the glomerulus, it preferentially constricts the efferent arteriole, so it increases glomerular hydrostatic pressure, which increases GFR and the filtration fraction. Second is in the proximal convoluted tubule, where it directly stimulates the sodium hydrogen exchanger, so there's more sodium reabsorption and hydrogen ion secretion. Therefore, more bicarb reabsorption, so metabolic alkalosis. This happens when the ECF volume reduces and angiotensin II is released. So angiotensin II plays a part in contraction alkalosis. Now on to the indirect effects. It stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. And that's why it's called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Aldosterone has receptors on both the principal cells and the alpha-intercalated cells of the kidney. In the principal cells, it stimulates the sodium-potassium ATPase and the epithelial sodium channels. So that increases sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. On the alpha intercalated cells, it increases hydrogen ATPase activity, so hydrogen ion secretion. It also stimulates the release of the antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary, which puts in aquaporin channels in the principal cells, increasing water reabsorption. To go with this, it stimulates the hypothalamus and increases thirst so more water intake. So put together, it increases arterial pressure, increases GFR and filtration fraction, reabsorbs sodium and water, increases potassium secretion, and causes contraction alkalosis. Now let's look at what stimulates its release. First, low arterial pressure. That makes sense. It vasoconstricts, so it increases blood pressure. It also reabsorbs sodium and water, so volume expansion also can increase pressure. This one is fast, and this one is slow. 
Second, low sodium chloride delivery to the macula densa. This forms a part of the tubuloglomerular feedback. It maintains a constant GFR over a wide range of renal plasma flow. If there's a low sodium chloride level in the distal convoluted tubule, the macula densa as a sensor detects it. It tells the JG cells that we need renin, and renin is released, converting angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 2, which then constricts the efferent arteriole and increases the GFR, so it restores the sodium chloride concentration. One more thing is that the JG cells have beta-1 receptors of the adrenergic system. So if there's an increased sympathetic tone, there can be release of renin. This system is regulated by inhibition through the natriuretic peptides. The atrial and the brain natriuretic peptides from the atria and the ventricles are released by stretch of these chambers when the volume is high and they cause natriuresis, which means elimination of sodium in urine. Now let's try applying the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system to put it together. Two situations. The first one is what happens when there's low blood volume. Low blood volume means low arterial pressure. That will stimulate renin. Angiotensinogen gets converted to angiotensin 1, and then by the angiotensin-converting enzyme, angiotensin-2 is formed. It constricts the vessels, increasing blood pressure. It reabsorbs sodium and indirectly stimulates aldosterone to reabsorb sodium, stimulates the antidiuretic hormone to reabsorb water, and increases thirst, so water retention. All of this together brings the blood pressure back up. What happens when there's a lot of salt intake? The salt causes the ECF to expand, the arterial pressure rises, so reduced renin, reduced angiotensin 2, less reabsorption of salt and water, and so the ECF volume and so the arterial pressure come towards normal. Two tie-ins here is that the angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, like captopril, inhibit the ACE enzyme, so reduce angiotensin 2 formation versus the angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs, like losartan, which block the angiotensin receptors and prevent the action of angiotensin 2. And that is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.